Stand by to receive our transmission. You're listening to the I guess we should actually get to some DCs at some point, right? DC, DC, DC. Uh, sure. No, what? I'm trying to be positive. You didn't sound positive. Well, because it's DC. You sounded like a troglodyte. AC, DC, AC, DC. Still no good. <laughs> I don't chant well. <laughs> Who does? I mean, monks maybe, but that's about it. I don't know. Why would... You, do you aspire to chanting well? Don't we all? Not particularly. I thought you were on Chantrix. Okay, one, that was eight years ago. <laughs> Two, chanting and Chantix, the anti-smoking drug, are not the same goddamn thing. No? No. I'm totally confused. That's easy to believe. You being you. Hey, kids. This is episode 214 of the Mean Geek Comics Podcasting on the Edge of Civility. You know, I've been thinking about that. <clears throat> about which? I feel that we should start over with one again. Why? Hey, no. We're not Marvels. Or DCs. I mean... Either we, way. We're, that's it not just us. makes perfect sense. Like, all the comics are doing it. No. No. Really, all the comics aren't doing it. No. No, we're not doing it. Why not? No. Because it's, it's pointless. Nobody cares about a number one podcast. Number one rated podcast, sure. But a brand, you know, starting from number one, nobody listens to the first show of, an ep- of a fucking podcast. Nobody wants that. And why not? Because they prefer established podcasts. Because they get the idea that people might actually enjoy what they're doing. Oh, I see. <laughs> no, we're not starting over from scratch. Fuck that. Boo. Don't you boo me. You would ju- be just as irritated when we got to 200 the next time. Well, yeah. <laughs> because then we could have been at 400. That, yeah, that would be the problem. And people... Oh... So you want to make this a limited series? <laughs> yeah. Number 214 of a limited series. <laughs> what the fuck? But you don't want to make it to 400. You, you hurt me terribly. Nah, I'll live. Yeah, well, so will I. Um, we've got absolutely nothing new to deal with because the comics news world is boring right now. And I'm okay with that because I constantly get angry at it. That's true. <laughs> yes, you do. Ah. Uh, What's good in the universe right now is Sinestro 12. Now, War World's reactors are about the bull, Captain. Did you actually turn over and recognize that? Yes, Star Trek. Oh, yes, very good. And uh, Saranic is a bit panicky, arguing with Sinestro about evacuating. He runs off and he goes and talks to Lissa, though, and she notes that Saranic's misgivings seem to predict betrayal. Mm, maybe. Is it betrayal when you betray Sinestro, really? Like, Well, I mean, certainly Lissa feels that way. Well, fair. So, um, Saranic and Umaral, with the weird chin guy, uh, talk for a bit about Sinestro's plans, but nothing really comes of it. It's, it's an okay conversation. There's nothing really going, wow, nice turn of phrase there. That's phenomenal. No, absolutely nothing. Sinestro has uh, an internal monologue about order and purpose. And eventually, Saranic and it, it finally is more like it. Not eventually, fucking finally. Saranic and Sinestro have this huge fight. And we get our little twist that Papa Sinestro has been waiting for forever. As Saranic takes on the mantle of a yellow lantern. Well, she takes on the outfit. Let's be honest. Oh, like, he even a... makes a point of saying, like, you don't yet. But like, well, you have the ability to install great fear. No, not really. But you <laughs> will. Well, you know, there's got to be some kind of potential there. Uh, no, I totally enjoy this. I, I have one huge annoyance factor, though. Uh-oh. 
Well, this followed the annual, right? And so the big reveal at the end of the annual is, I know who set the bomb. Yeah. And we have no idea who exactly. the fuck yeah. set the bomb. Yeah. Because that's the way drama is built up these days. Let it Grr. go for a little bit. It'll be fine. What are you worried about? They literally ignore the bomb from that point. It's like, what? What? No, there's a bomb in the react. Like, we should be doing something. Let's fight over your outfit. <laughs> they daughter. did seem to take an incredibly long time at it. But Sinestro the whole time is just like, yeah, we got guys. They'll figure it out. It'll be fine. What are you worried about? Come on. Which seems rather leger faire to me. Well, he's Sinestro. <laughs> he knows he's going to be fine. <laughs> and hell if anybody else is. I did, like, that always bugs me. When people call Sinestro out, like, you're so arrogant. I'm like, but duh. <laughs> Have you met me? You're shocked by this? How? I don't... Is anybody shocked, though? So, Ronnie, well, they're all kind... They're constantly kind of like... Why aren't you doing about this? Because I have it well in hand. But why aren't you doing anything? Because I have it. It's like, well, Sinestro thinks his plan's going to work. And historically, well, okay, fine. (laughs) I mean, fine. Eight years ago, when every time he went up a grand screen lantern, he ended up in, you know, green bars. like a Yeah, those didn't work out. But once Hal Jordan and the rest of the emerald doofuses uh, have taken a back seat to his adventures... Everything's worked out for him, really. What hasn't worked out Not in 12 issues? Everything's been pretty Even much when his plans don't work, like, he ends up with more power and more followers and fine. Like, worst case scenario, it's like, well, I'm still incredibly powerful and successful. You think that guy actually grew out his hair, chopped it off, and then glued it to his eyebrows? Everything about that guy causes me not to think about him. What are we watching? This girl is badass. <laughs> Which sounds like a really bad fanfic. <laughs> and maybe. We this don't know. This girl is poison. This could, be, this could be a Thai fanfic. We don't know. I can only hope not. <laughs> oh, no. Don't talk about placentas. Jesus Christ. Um, in Batgirl 14, 41. <laughs> now, I actually like this, this issue for once. I was fine with it. Oh, really? When uh, she meets her mustacheless dad, the new robo... No, that, that I had great issue with, but Barbara barging in and taking out a group who actually worships her digital copy preparing to assault Burnside to continue her mission. She just takes him out. She's just like, yeah, well, you guys are dumb, and th- this is a ridiculous thing, and I'm the real bat girl, so I'm going to stop you. Oh, wait, New Bats is here. What's he doing there? Uh, well, he interrupts everything, and she just goes home, tells her roommate about it. But it's not—it's not the plot that's really got me going. There's there's details about Barbara that seem to have improved here. I don't know. I just get this this feeling that she's not more competent. Yeah, she's not the giant doofus of previous issues. Cause well. I'm, like she, heroes being doofuses. She is getting arrested by her own father at the end of the issue. Well, yeah, there's that, but that's because he's officially an official Batman of the official police department of Gotham now. Which seems, uh, it, it, at, in some degree, it seems like a perfectly valid evolution of the vigilantism that they've tacitly allowed to occur the whole 75 years. But uh, why did it have to be Jim Bloody Gordon? What I you know, this whole convergence thing is obviously throwing us off a little bit since we haven't read that. But Jim, I don't know that that's got a damn thing to do with it. Of course it does, because that man is missing because his world lost or something. Who knows? But, yeah, but he really isn't, as we'll see soon. So, Robo Bunny Batman costume. <laughs> that thing is terrible, man. Dude, it looks ridiculous. I don't see why he needs to have a mohawk. I mean, what what does a guy his age, how did it occur to him to, to shave a mohawk? Dude, the, the best occurred in one of the other issues, actually, where uh, Bullock's <laughs> like, what are you, 67? Or 64? Like, I'm 47. <laughs> uh, Jim takes her out for ice cream and tells her, look, man, I'm new bats. That's why there's this big change. But it turns out that it wasn't the digital image of Batgirl at that worship service. It was live wire possibly pretending to be. And now she's loose in town. Live what? wire? Is that a real live Batman villain? Live wire? 
No, that's a Superman villain. Oh, okay. Why the hell she's in Gotham is beyond me. Well, they, they intimate that Batman took her down at some point, so... Well, I mean, he takes everybody down at some point. I mean, that's what he does, that's who he is, that's how it works. You got nothing to do with it. Wow, she punches him with steel cubes in her hand and they die. <laughs> and her fingers break off like chiclets. Yeah, that's, they're missing that part of them. <laughs> no, but there, there was a different tone somehow in this one. And no, I, I thought it markedly that. improved. I didn't have as big a problem with the old tone as you did. Uh, it, the new Batgirl is a fine book. Uh, her best friend wanting to be a sidekick without having any powers is kind of neat, although Invincible <laughs> already kind of did that with William. Right. There's a lot of neat things happening. The Jim Gordon thing is just so glaringly awful. <laughs> Glaringly awful. <laughs> it's so hard to not focus on that piece of it. And it took a lot of effort. RBB I, is killing me. RBB. Robo Bunny Bat. Uh, you spend time actually making this stuff up, don't no. you? No. That's the sad part. Uh, whatever. There's, um, there's something I was looking forward to. Oh? But... Once I got to it, I was kind of like, whatevs. <laughs> I don't know. Bat might won. Kind of. I was, I was looking forward to it. I was like, yeah, now we can have a, a joke-filled humor book. And uh, no. <laughs> it's not. That's not true. It was joke-filled. They just, it was, it was a lot of corny one-liners. Yeah. Um, like Batmite saying hello nurse that was, that's a Warner Brothers requirement when there's a nurse running around yeah I suppose that's that true. happens so Batmite has been has faced sentencing for unknown crimes and being exiled to earth at some point he comes across uh, the Batmobile and hijacks it chasing down some surgically themed criminals <laughs> they all eventually run in the Batman they find a girl in the criminal's trunk and Batman leaves with her but some nurse shows up and knocks Batmite's ass out. How sad is that? Like, Yeah, he's an interdimensional being of limitless power. How come she gets to just smack him around and call it even? This is, this is just not... And there were a couple funny moments here or there. Yeah. They, she takes his ass to Dr. Trauma... Oh my god Who's a terrible name Who transfers brains between bodies And their next victim Is Everyone's favorite whipping boy Hawkman What? Don't bring Hawkman into this I Please, get the for feeling, God's sake I, I get the feeling this whole thing's going to be about Batmite Venturing out, you know, out into the DCU Yeah because Hawkmite is just never showing up. No, please don't show me a Hawkmite. I will have to, like... I don't know what I'll do. It'll be something horrible. You've been waiting a long time for a Batmite book. I was! There's still room. There's still time. It's the first issue. Dr. Trauma could end up funny as shit. I don't know. Dan, Dan Jurgen? He's never really been a comedy writer. Yeah, I don't see the correlation where that... Like, you've got Keith Giffen. <laughs> Dematis can make, fun, make some funny yeah, stuff. Yeah, you've got Giffen. You've got, Demat- you've got guys who are historically designed for this kind of book. <laughs> and, right. you, and I don't have a problem with Dan Jurgens having a job. I just <laughs> don't... Like, it doesn't I, seem a fit. I've not read a ton... Like, I've certainly read a few Dan Jurgens and Breeding Supermans back in the day and all that. I don't once ever remember being like, that's a really funny issue. <laughs> nah, I and mean, maybe I missed him. Sure, possibly, but... He didn't do the uh, Batman, uh, Superman Bugs Bunny, did he? Oh, I don't even remember that. No? I remember it, but I don't remember if I even uh, read it. Nah, neither do I. Wasn't it like a four-part miniseries? Yeah, yeah. I have, I've got at least two of them, possibly three. Yeah, because there's one uh, Batman and Donald Duck and... yeah. And I read them, and I, I don't remember how funny they were, and I don't so, remember if he did them. 
So who the fuck knows? <laughs> it's not an auspicious. It's not terrible anyway. And I thought the art worked actually quite well. It was cartoon. No, the art was fine. But yeah. it was still within the world. Like you, you, when you can draw Batman and Batmite and not have one look glaringly terrible. <laughs> That means you've got it together for the most part. Yep. <laughs> Master Tanarachi, I can't deal with this movie, dude. None of this dialogue makes a lick of fucking sense. Good, don't follow the dialogue. Well, that's the only way you know what's going on. Just wait till people are punching each other and look up. It's oh, simple. All right, well, that'll work then. Um, Bizarro number one, dude. Oh, I see that look. You can't tell if you're happy with it or not. I actually found parts of it quite amusing. Yes, so did I. Uh, <laughs> the chupacabra was hysterical. I love the pet chupacabra. The, the, the interplay between Jimmy Olsen and Bizarro, I quite like. The <laughs> art style is hysterical. The fact that they stumble upon a pharaoh-themed car lot. Used car fucking deal not even that the fact that they basically revamped King Tut (laughs) it's true all of that was kind of awesome my one glaring problem with Bizarro is the dialogue is so annoying ah yeah it is hard to to stay consistent with the me am and the not is it's not even tried that hard although I did like the fact that Jimmy Olsen kept getting it wrong like and, you know, and constantly being frustrated because that's the way I feel so I totally related to that <laughs> so I actually thought it was really good this is a much more fun book than Batmite was uh, this is exactly what I wanted from Batmite but no this was awesome when, <laughs> when I look back and I'm like this is a miniseries I was actually a little disappointed because I was like, this is actually killing it right now. <laughs> like, Jimmy Olsen on the road with Bizarro for, like, that's... <laughs> if it stays uh, with this team, that's I would be That's comedy gold about right there. Man. Yeah, i actually quite looking forward to the next one. <laughs> and King Tut becoming a cosmic elder god worshipping <laughs> uber villain to sell cars, cars. <laughs> and keep his daughter in town. <laughs> and there's a minor subplot where uh, Jimmy seems to be Engaging in mutual attraction with the owner's daughter. Owner's daughter. Well, he's Jimmy Olsen. That he bags babes. Ah, uh, really? Did he have him lined up when he was Turtle Boy? Yes, he did not. That's not true. He was a. Uh, you what? Uh, Supergirl was into him. I think you're pushing it. That's uh, one. Lois Lane's sister. And plenty of random... He was like Archie. He's literally (laughs) exactly like Archie. Put Archie in a bow tie and remove the cross hatching from the side of his head. (laughs) Spot the blacks a little bit more. Uh, No, 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 no spot blacking. Black spotting? No. I don't know. Oh, hey, no, that's not what I was going for. No. We're not having a recap of three episodes ago. Black Canary, though. (laughs) Your tongue is out. You don't like this shit. All right, go ahead. Read your little... (sighs) Dinah keeps touring around with this band, but keeps ruining the bars they play in. Because she's an angry, angry woman. Can't stop punching people. They play in Detroit, so I can understand that. Because I live in Detroit, and if it's one thing you want to do in Detroit is fucking punch people, (laughs) because you're in fucking Detroit. And if you're listening and you live in Detroit, I'm sorry, dude. I had my shot. I got the fuck out. (laughs) It's true. Eight mile. I lived on 12 and 7. Give me that shit. I'll show you goddamn 12 mile. Uh, Where was I? They play in Detroit. Uh, During the Detroit gig, Dinah sees these weird shadowy creatures in the audience. Because the fucking comic book isn't complete without shadowy creatures. You know? Yet the Shadow Thief can't get work. Yeah, somehow. Jeez. They fight, but she can't win without her canary cry, which, of course, ruins the fucking joint. (laughs) They don't get paid. The band is mad at her. (laughs) And they're like, we kind of got to kick you out, Dinah. But, I mean, we don't want to, but we kind of want to keep playing. I mean, what are you going to (laughs) do? Well, you go the opposite route, actually. But the uh, tone is there. They, they oh yeah, don't. no. Uh, 
Apparently, the shadow creatures are chasing after their eight-year-old mute guitarist that they just found. Which is just another wacko, bizarre thing. So, not that you can't have eight-year-old mute guitar gods, but they want to keep Dinah in the band so that she can protect their guitar. Uh, you know, like you know, you don't lose Jimmy Page. So, <laughs> and Dinah is now going to train all of them to be kung fu fighters. Everybody was kung fu fighting. No, dude, it's it is not. Okay, <laughs> it's just not. Oh, but this is DCU. It's all about you. Wait Did, a minute. Tell me when you were reading this. Like each time you turn a page, you weren't like, no. It. I said no many times. I'm like, really, fellas, this is what you're going for. Now like, this was a you because we both experimented a couple times on this one. Yeah, this was a you. Are you getting any more of this? I mean, I have to because you got to order three months ahead. But that doesn't mean I'm But we, we're not it. even sure which ones we did more of one and which ones we didn't. Well, I mean, I can look it up. I just don't yeah. have the memory. But once you get past the ones you've already ordered based on this... Yeah, probably not. <laughs> unless 2 is, like, amazingly better. Yeah, unless 2 just slams me up against the wall and makes me cry for mommy. I just... Wow, when you're talking about a Black Canary book that has a couple meanings and they're all creepy. Uh, why do you do things like that? You could have just left it alone and I, everything had been fine. I couldn't have. Yes, you could. You really, I'm really not could. Of it. Why are your nails shiny like that? Do you buff your nails? Good lord, no. <laughs> they're not glossed, are they? Um, no, nor do I know what that means. Well, I mean, come on. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to think about what glossing your nails might mean. And there's the obligatory woman washing her clothes routine. Yes, that guy in every film. It, right, what, it's in a lot of films. Next DC. And it's always in slow motion. So, the next DC is Harley Quinn Power Girl 1. All right, well, this one is my fault. The, wait, it was more fun than... It Black was fun. Canary? Um, well, yeah. I mean, woohoo. <laughs> uh, the girl just caught her creeping on the laundry girl. <laughs> it was definitely better. It so it jumps right in, following the end of the Black, uh, the um, Harley Quinn book. Right. So now they got them as a team up. Power Girl has an unlikely sidekick who she doesn't actually care for, but will grow to love. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the events of uh, Harley Quinn 11, 12, and 13, uh, they're teleported across the galaxy, and they come across a pervert that talks like Yoda, whom they, <laughs> whom they piss off, so he calls an alien Hydra in. <laughs> it, during the fight, they find Vartox's ship. But Power Girl has no memory of Vartox because it's an alternate universe Power Girl because, of course, everything's an alternate universe now. Which, of course, is how they can re-justify the classic Power Girl outfit. Right. Sorry, costume. Ew, whatever. Uh, The head takes them to Lustox where Oreth Odiox is holding Vartox. And can you have a whole lot more fucking X's in the ends of names there? Dude, I just enjoy, enjoyed the, the completely serious use of the word groovy. Like, uh, <laughs> it mildly amused me that they kept getting uh, mistaken for prostitutes. There's a, it was funny. Um, I almost feel like putting the two of them together could be the best way to bring two books that almost hit off successfully. Well, I don't think Harley Quinn's over, is it? Who knows? It's a new DCU. Yeah. Whatever. These guys got to make up their minds. I mean, just throw some good stories at it. If you want to make them about a given thing, great. But do we have to have all this bullshit marketing that just gets in the way of going into the books open? It's hard. Uh, Yeah, because, like... You've also got Harley Quinn in Suicide Squad. It gets very confusing when you have people in multiple books, but, I mean, that's comic book 101. Like, Wolverine's in 85 things sometimes. (laughs) Spider-Man, 207. (laughs) Ben Grimm used to have to juggle, like, three books. 
Now like I can't even get a book. Yeah, well, I mean, he only had 36 issues, for God's sake. Not Marvel team up. All right, well, I mean, mm -hmm. well over yeah, 100 that, of that. That was that was his book, but when he got the thing, that was. Well, you know, when Dan Slott revamped it, he got eight or ten. Are you sure it wasn't intended to be short? I didn't think so. Eh, well, it hardly matters. Um, so that's uh, HQ and PG. What do you think? You know, I, I had fun with it. I, I didn't laugh as often as I might have suspected I would laugh. But, you know. <laughs> I'm hoping, <laughs> like, because Power Girl had a lot of high points. Uh, yeah. But you hated it, it. How can you say that? It. Nick Connor is a great artist. So, yeah. it looked great. I like the fact that they were trying to do something with the character, but yeah, no, I never really enjoyed the book because the backstory was terrible again and again and again. Now, Harley Quinn, on the other hand, had a lot of backstory, but didn't necessarily bring the funny the same way. It felt forced sometimes. Yeah. So perhaps the two of them playing off each other can kind of bring both of them together into a better book. Well, I, sh I, I really hope so because it would be enjoyable to have a comedy book here and there. <laughs> and if not, then we have... A canceled book, so either way. Yeah, we get away with it. Now, there's another Connor Palmiotti book coming around. And you did this one. No, I this did this one. This was not Palmiotti. This is just Connor. I was surprised oh, by yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Connor and well, somebody I mean, else. They're, they're so ubiquitous with each other, it's hard to determine when they're separate or not. No, it was totally my assumption, too, that it was. It, I just happened to look. I'm like, wait, no. So... <laughs> Starfire, number one. We've not been looking at Red Hood. So not we have, since the first issue. Right. So we have no fucking clue why Corey is out by herself and seemingly semi-innocent again. <laughs> well, obviously, the whole idea of Convergence is whatever world won, that character moves forward. It seems to be. We haven't read it, so... It should be almost done, so we should be doing that soon, right? Once Seeker Wars. The convergence is done. We're waiting for Seeker Wars. Right? Yeah, which is another two months, three right. months. So I think it gets six tomorrow. So uh, anyway, it's absolutely mind-bogglingly terrible trying to wait for this shit. But I think so. One of the things you have to accept is that everything's a little bit different as a result of that. However, I'm tired of accepting this shit. Just yeah, well, you know, I mean, have something make sense every once in a while. The thing is, like both Red Hood one and Starfire one play off the idea that Starfire isn't human and doesn't quite get things. Right. Um, Red Hood played it off in a way that made her <laughs> more sexually aggressive and very. I don't want to say unlikable. <laughs> but it was pretty close. Yeah, it wasn't a character you're like, oh, this plays it very sweetly. Yeah. But they both very much read, and I know, I mean, it kind of was involved in writing, but they read like, you know, like this is the male idea of somebody who doesn't get what's going on around them, <laughs> so to speak. Like, oh, you're pretty, let's make out. And <laughs> What? Uh, I don't even know why she's in southern Florida, but she's hanging out with the local sheriff, Gomez. And uh, it turns out, you know, Corey's going to need some dough because she needs a place to stay. She needs real clothes. But um, she's got some gems from her old world, and they hawk those. And they go drinking and have some guys fight over Corey. And Gomez eventually finds her a place to live where she immediately starts making out with a guy. <laughs> <laughs> then the hurricane hits and the issue ends. Eventually, uh, no, well, not eventually, interspersed through all that, we get to meet uh, Gomez's brother and his Coast Guard crew who seem to be nascent good characters, I suppose. I mean, uh, everything, it's, it's too hard to judge yet. I love the fact that there's a huge back 
cast right from the first issue. Yes. So all these people meeting Corey and involving her in things. Which is, you know, again, what you need to have a full hero. Yep. No, I... uh, And, you know, we've debated this to varying degrees. I'm much more, like, gung-ho about it than you. But I think... Like when you look at a book, and we talked about this recently on the Marvel one, Miss Marvel, where they nail that piece so well. Right. It just adds so much to the overall book. And hopefully this book can accomplish that same kind of thing. I found this, Corey, insanely likable. <laughs> it's a very sweet book. It is definitely female friendly. My yeah. one caveat of this book is that it's your classic artist. Writing a book, ah, and it's very dialogue heavy and <laughs> over explanatory in a couple of like there's a couple of things where you're trying to find the picture behind all the word bubbles. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that is absolutely the truth. It was. Uh, I won't say it was a chore, at all. No, I actually thought it. Was, like I said, it was quite sweet, and I liked it. Now this was a you. Yeah. Now, if this is... Uh, do you see this one continuing? Well, for a few, anyway, you know. It's always nice to have a few DCs running around. Yeah, we definitely needed to upgrade, it which was, is why. It was getting terrible with these DCs. Yeah. I, I was so close to just going Sinestro and Batman and calling it even. And then Superman took an uptick, so I was optimistic. And so did uh, Wonder Woman. And so did Wonder Woman. So the, I, I felt that there was... Little, little reason not to try a couple of more. Yeah, we we both tried to jump onto the bandwagon of a few, and it didn't hurt that you know these are characters I know. Yeah, you know, that's if, always kind of helpful. If they had brought back another Pandora or some other New Fifty Two person, I don't give a shit about. I totally wouldn't have bothered in the least. <laughs> so. Good grief. Are you enjoying Justice League 3001? I, um... Justice League 3001. Let me just start with this. This was another me. Yeah. Uh, first off, if you're going to have Super Buddies in it and the entire first issue doesn't feature Booster Gold or Blue Beetle, <laughs> you're going to annoy me. I just like get that out of the way. Well, technically they did that last year with 3000. But they're in this book. Like, they're referencing them like Fire and Ice are going to meet them. Yeah. The female Guy Gardner made for a couple laughs. The incredibly creepy Superman. It's a <laughs> funny book. And they brought back Elron. Or LR7, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, you know, it's it's a version of It's basically Elron. It's him. <laughs> and they did, you know, like, having the mind of Lois Lane be the evil villain in Ariel was kind of clever and... It's very Giffen and Dematis. I thought it was very funny. It had the mm-hmm. same problem that the Justice League 3000 had, which is I didn't really like anyone in the Justice League. But <laughs> they're playing that a little differently now. A little bit. Like, will you remember when we read the very first one? We were both like, what? Yeah, had no clue what we were we were even looking at on the page. And but you know, as they built up the humor, and the one or two we got with Booster Gold and Blue Beetle in them, right. were much funnier, much stronger books. So I think this book has potential. Like it's got a great art team in Howard Porter. Yep. The writers are both really funny and very good comic book writers. And the variations on Superman and Batman and what and Wonder Woman are all kind of clever. Mostly. And the female Guy Gardner could lead to hysterics. Particularly when Booster and uh, Beetle get involved. (laughs) Just imagine a world where uh, Booster Gold keeps hitting on Guy Gardner. Ew. Okay, maybe I don't want that world. (laughs) I don't know about that one. I didn't think about that. You always bring up stuff I didn't think about that and be disgusted by. Uh, It was kind of bizarre. There's a a Starro outbreak, but... The Starros are actually like rehabilitating that world, well, and they've agreed over. to be slaves. No, 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 no. Uh, they got permission from the rest of the universe to take over the world, and that's why uh, they set fire to all the bodies of the people who rebelled. Eh. So they send Guy to go figure out if that was even legal. 
because the stars are like, go check. It's fine. We 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 got permission. It's, it's like, yes, you can fish on my lake. What? No, <laughs> you can't do that. Dude, uh, political staro is a thing to be reckoned with. Superman forty one. Clark gets an anonymous tip about arms dealers that use three D printers. Which can be done. They're not terribly reliable. They don't make moving parts, however. And they certainly can't make tanks. Well, this is a... It's uh, a comic book. Yeah, yeah. And I'm with that. But Let, you know. why would you need a portable printer that makes tanks when you can just have a factory that makes fucking tanks? I mean, it's just... There's... Finding a solution to a problem that doesn't I exist. didn't actually think of that, and that's totally valid. Like, you, know, you want a tank? Uh, like, let's just make a tank. We don't really need to do this. Because one, one way or another, you've got to get the materials to make a tank out to the area where the tank needs to be. Plus, really, like the plastic tank, how helpful is that going to be? Now, you can pull all this shit with like, oh, but it's, it's nano-constructed out of... Yeah, yeah. Titanium alloy, carbonadium, but I just don't see the efficiency gain by making it on site as opposed to what in the fuck are they doing to that poor cake? <laughs> anyway, Clark fights the printer and the tank <laughs> for fuck's sake, <laughs> but he has to flare to destroy it, which seems like. I guess he might be a little weak at this point still. But, you know, it seems like, all right, well, we developed this power, so we need to have him use it. Yeah, maybe. It might just be him testing it in different scenarios. Could be, but usually they'll tell you something like that. Uh, Lois butts in, glory stealing, and Clark gets uh, warned someone has had... Hi, how are you? Someone has his identity. I mean, uh, let's not forget the girl with the blue dreads that he's got to sell out to the police. So he has to dress up a la Ramita and Miller's a, Daredevil in all black with sunglasses. I had a kind of rough time with that. I was like, he's just going to believe her because he got this anonymous note and it might be her. And I don't. Well, the, I thought they did that quite well because. They get an anonymous tip, which they follow up on, yeah. because they're reporters. They get quite a few, and like both, they make several analogies to the fact that those almost never work out. Right. And so this leads them to a phenomenal story with, and once again, we have the local senator, governor, or whatever, being an undercover arms dealer, because <sighs> that's totally a thing. Whatever. Oh, look, she's teaching him to cook. No, more fights. God. Still in all, Superman 41 is a decent enough book. Yeah, I'm still enjoying Superman. It's not a stinker by any stretch. Do you get... Are you wondering if they're going to be leading towards the Superman Lois Lane thing and Wonder Woman going off in her own book? I'm just... I'm not even trying to think about that. You don't want to hope for anything that doesn't happen? Nope. I don't see how they've made it this long without them getting back together. It's kind of ridiculous. Anyway, I don't like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Constantine number one. Now, like I was saying before, all the beats of what you expect to be in a Constantine book are there. I'm not particularly certain that they were done all that well. <laughs> I, it's, it's not so much that this is, in fact, Constantine. It's more like, this is my impression of Constantine. I'm going to write him like I feel he is. Well, I mean... Which is what validly most writers really do. But when a writer comes on a book, they can either embrace the character and go with it and go find some history and love the character and write them recognizably or they can say I heard Constantine does this I'll have him smoke see I'm going to disagree with you and I'm not going to defend the book because I, I, I thought it was fine I didn't love it 
Yeah. And I think the killing off his ghost storyline is intriguing. I'm actually a little excited about that idea. Yeah, because if he could get rid of them, I don't know. It, it, or, like, it puts him in a really weird quandary. Sorry to cut you off, but... If yeah. He defends the things that have been haunting him. Right. To keep them, he screws his own life. But if he lets something continue to destroy them and screws them even further after already getting them killed... Mm. So I thought that was I really see. cool. What I what I think the problem for me with this book was is the storyline is very Constantine. Like a demon that he's sleeping with Ew. is in business with another demon that she wants to get rid of, so she's using Constantine to do it for her, and he tricks her and sends her back to hell. This is classic John Constantine. I think the problem right. is the kind the of thing you expect from or the, the way the writer is attract um, it's the tone. You're used to like this morbidly dark con- and this is almost like how do I say this? The Brave and the Bold John Constantine. Like everything's <laughs> still there, but it's so clean and bright looking. Yeah. It didn't feel like you didn't have that just tone of British misery pouring off of every page. <laughs> British misery. <laughs> but really, if you think about it, that's the biggest factor is that it just doesn't feel right. It's, I, and I don't think that they're doing like, the things badly because this isn't badly done at all. No, not really. And there are a couple awesome, like classic giant... Like, like the demon challenged him. He's like, well, I'm ready, willing, and able. And then it hits him really hard and he's like, well, I'm willing... Like, that's classic John Con. Like, <laughs> I suck at a lot of things. I fake spells well, and I get out of shit a lot. <laughs> that's 90% of what he does, really, right there. And, you know, the creepy demon sex thing, like, that's totally in character. Is it? Would he bang demons? He'd bang anything. <laughs> Ew. I read a lot of, of Hellblazer in... The mid nineties, ninety five to ninety seven or so, got a lot of them out the dollar box. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't remember a goddamn thing that happened. There are uh, certain storylines that are really worth revisiting; others not, just like any other book. But the main thing, like I think that this fit really well. The style of art w- was lighter, and it was very clean. Like I'm used to, like yeah. it being really dark. Right, it's a dark book. There's actually line art in this, and a lot of the Constantine stuff, the, a lot of the Hellblazer stuff, I should say. Um, it wasn't painted, but it was less defined. Right. And Constantine One had kind of a similar problem, if you think back. It didn't quite feel correct. Right. And it's not like I loved everything in Hellblazer. There were plenty of storylines I didn't like or art styles I didn't like, but it always had a very serious tone. Yeah. This is like dumbing it down slightly. And it's hard to say that because, yeah, you've got this guy um, who's openly bisexual, who's willing to sleep with demons, who has his own ghost from people he's been at least roughly involved in the death of. These are all things that are not easily put into the PG-13 DC universe. Yeah. Nothing wrong with any of them, but they're not, you know, cookie cutter and clean. Right. Right. Which is why they probably should have put it back in Vertigo. It belonged better there, and it always will. Yeah, I think so. It, however, this wasn't a terrible start. Like, there was a... And there's a couple cool moments. Like, the opening, it just, like I said, it never felt quite right. But the opening, when he goes in there, and he scams this girl into a new wardrobe because he's covered in blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's and, to- that's totally fitting. Yeah, and then the ghost would be like, "Dude, you just screwed that girl. Like, she's gonna end up." But it just has this light touch that doesn't fit it at all. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm with you. It's closer to the Constantine TV show, I guess, and that thing's already gone. So yeah, <laughs> I suppose I'll catch up with that someday. But I'm not in any rush. I got like 16 other TV shows to get to. Uh, Super and uh, not Superman. Super Arrow, Girl. Flash, and Gotham being three of them. Supergirl, when that comes out. Yeah, Agents I might actually, of S.H.I.E.L.D. I might actually pay attention to that one. I finished watching the second season of S.H.I.E.L.D. 
And it, it ramped up again. You know, the second half of season one took a huge jump in quality upwards. And in two, coasted on that. And then halfway through that, it jumped up again. That was a hardcore kick right into that fucking car door. That hurt a lot. Which is why the guy is knocked out. That'll do it. Uh, Batman 41. Jesus fucking Christ. Just, just... <sighs> Quit playing fuck around with Batman. The, 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 the big thing here is there's a huge sports star who lives in a bad neighborhood and some jackass with this stupid, convoluted, pointless plan who was right there with the sports star creates this energy being for some reason to trample around Gotham why? To keep the cops distracted while he held a gun to the sports star to get the money? Um, what? What's the... What? No, seriously. You follow shit and recognize things at a much more detailed I, level you know, than I do. I cannot find out why the fuck this needed to happen the way it did. I was focusing more on the Jim Gordon avoiding... Uh, trying not to be <laughs> Batman and... That, you know, that at least seemed in character for the fucking book. And all the trainees who want to be Batman and aren't, or, you know, like, like the guy's training in freaking police academy wearing <laughs> Batman masks. <laughs> I just, couldn't they think of anything else less convoluted? I mean, if the guy wasn't with the sports star, if the guy was, like, say, in the energy creature and on his way to the sports star. Yeah, let me see this book. But it doesn't... The guy's already got a gun on the guy. What is this energy creature thing doing even existing? I, I didn't follow why that thing had to be there to begin with. And it bothered me because that... There's so many trillions of other ways to tell a good, bad story. You're going to try to figure it out with the book right now in hand, aren't uh, you? You know, I'm not even remembering parts of this. So. <laughs> What's that tell you? The clear alien you thing. You read that two fucking hours ago. Yep. The uh, You read alien. that two hours ago, and you retain so much more reading comprehension than I could hope to in a week. Yep. No, Batman fighting the alien creature, and then the mob boss. There's nothing. There's no point. There's, it's ridiculously overwrought. It's like, well, let's do this. Well, how do we make that bigger? All right. Well, we did that. Well, how do we make it more bigger? Is there stakes? Yes, of course there are stakes. Why do we care about stakes? I don't know. Make them bigger. It's essentially a robbery. There's nothing else to it. There's a robbery. The guy could have robbed him all on his own. He had him at gunpoint. I yeah, can't no, I understand uh, how this thing. So many people adored this fucking issue on Twitter, and I don't see any of their points of view. I, you know, I thought that they did Gordon well. I love the fact that Bullock put a huge robot-sized uh, trench coat up to, for him to wear over the suit. <laughs> I thought that there were a cut like they get stuff well I just I don't see the point of Jim Gordon being Batman I can't fathom that or even that either I can't fathom I, if I push it deeply enough in my brain I can see why I can't like they've already replaced him multiple times they've already survived without him multiple times like suddenly like oh Batman's gone we need and well, at least Batman well really the only twist on that whole motif they have left is to making him Jim fucking which is Gordon. why they did it which is what's driving me crazy about it plus like I mean it screams we've run out of other ideas yeah Jim Gordon semi-vigilante just irks me to no end <laughs> he's a privateer is what he is really <laughs> It's not a stretch at all, is it? He's sanctioned to go break the law. Up until the point that he's not. And that's what most privateers died as pirates. Like, people forget that part. Shit didn't go well for them half the time. 
<laughs> Let's move on. We only got three books left. What's next? Uh, what's next is Wonder Woman 41. All right. So, Diana visits Doma. Domia? Doma. Hoping to start rehabilitating her. I don't remember who she was. Oh, well, that's what the lady with the baby? Oh, no, I'm writing this down wrong. That's Zola. Yeah. Donna. Donna Troy. She goes and visits her in prison to try to start rehabilitating her. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, this is you. um... Yeah, that's what happened. She visits. um... And then she goes and visits Zola. Uh, Zola was first. They talk about the. But they're interrupted by an uncharacteristically nice Hera. No, it's it starts with uh, it, it yep, starts with Donna, right. and then she goes and talks to Zola for a little while. But they're interrupted by a Hera, who is you know like I said, uncharacteristically nice. It's not it's not encouraging when Hera gets out of character. Yeah, no, uh, friendly Hera freaks everybody out. Uh-oh. Well, you know, if Zeus isn't cheating on her every eight minutes, maybe she calms right the fuck down. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, uh, Diana visits Hephaestus' forge to pick up her new, complex, overwrought, and completely pointless armor. Well, you also have to figure out, uh, Hephaestus is sitting there. He's got all the rogue Amazons working for him since they slaughtered all of his Trojans or whatever. Like, yeah. And he's like, Dude, why? why are you doing this to me? Now, I'm looking at the armor. And overall, it's fine. It's a costume it keep, change. It keeps enough motifs. It keeps enough points from older costumes to be fine. Except for those silly-ass arm spikes. She had a perfectly good sword. There was nothing wrong with her sword. She didn't lose it. She didn't break it. It wasn't stolen. What? Is that on the cover of the armstrong? Yeah, it's on the cover right right there. (laughs) Now, a lot of people on Twitter were talking about, I don't like the shoulder pads. I don't don't know, like, I I can't give a shit about shoulder pads. They're not. Um, They're they're, they're more armor. They're lame, but she's They're not great, but I don't know if I'd go as far as lame. They're totally lame. Like, it's a shoulder (laughs) pad. It's unnecessary because it's not... If it's going to be considered armor, it would have to continue on further down. Like, it ought to, sure. So it is unnecessary. It's Liefeld. Well, it's a shoulder pad with no purpose. There's an there's an excessive volume to Liefeld stuff. But it's <laughs> it's iconic and unnecessary. It's completely <laughs> the same thing. I, I know what you're saying. Yes, like it's not 18 feet taller than her head, <laughs> but that's still there. But she's worn shoulder pads in other armors before. Sure. Because you have to have shoulder armor if you're going to wear armor. Because otherwise, you've well, got this joint most, just in the way, just ready to get destroyed. Most of her armor doesn't have sleeves or friggin' <laughs> legs. So you'll pardon me if I'm not too particular. Like, you have to have shoulder armor. Not if you're not going to cover wrists, you know, shit. Like, oh, uh, well, she's got the bands for those. You know, as long as no one hits her anywhere between her wrist and her shoulder, she's fine. <laughs> and who's ever been done? The, like, anybody who's ever picked up a stick and swung it at anybody else knows that the arm is pretty much where you're going to hit <laughs> yeah, 90% of the that's time. that's where you're hitting. Um, she's then contacted by Cyborg. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Who notes that uh, there's this person... Claiming they're going to commit suicide unless Diana talks to them. Really? <laughs> he jets out though, because he's just like, "I'm glad you came. Bye." It what? He has a mysterious encounter. Cyborg, with, superpowered courier with some creature that promises weapons of capable of killing her. Interesting, but not particularly compelling. Is the guy at the end? Yeah. The one that she fights. Right. Steve Trevor. I think it may be. Let me double check real quick. The one she actually fights. Yeah. Or the one that's... The masked guy in the last two or three Uh, stages. Yeah. Sure looks like Quite possibly. He is blonde. He's male. For the God of War, you sure are good at talking your way out of a fight. 
How did he know it was a god? Because it's Steve Trevor. Trevor. Yeah, I think so. So he goes and picks up a Pegasus to make need, sure... They need the weapons to beat the god. Yep. There's, there's some arrows in there, too. So that's okay. Steve Trevor and the Argonauts. Steve Trevor and the Argonauts. Don't give them any ideas for a new book. Please, for it God's sake. It feels like... Um, this book, out of all of them, feels like it changed the least. Yeah. Two yeah. issues off, let's go right back to the same thing. True enough, I suppose. We only got two left. Okay. Let's launch into Detective. Detective 41, Jim... Robo Bat Bunny Boy. Let's add just another B in there. Um, Robo Bunny Batman. You could write a good theme song with that, though. Robo Bunny Batman. He's not good. Nah, never mind. Um, <laughs> He's what? here to hop on crime. No. He's out kicking some serious ass. Harvey's getting some off of his former partner who's been suspended for some reason. Because uh, um, she shot that kid. Which kid? In the previous storyline, remember she shot a kid and they tried to cover it up. And no, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened. Seriously, how many issues ago you figured out was uh, four? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Harvey's waffling about joining the team New Bats. He's not waffling; he's out and out against it. No, he had a tone every once in a while where he would think of it. And no, because he doesn't believe Batman is actually missing. Yeah. And uh, he wants Jim Gordon back. Like, uh, he doesn't know Jim Gordon in the suit. So, no, he's very much against the idea, the whole idea. And then he picks a fight with some bikers in a bar, yelling and screaming about it being a cop bar. Uh, I'm gonna, knowing that that would piss off the biker guys. I'm going to amend. He starts a fight. He doesn't pick a fight because he actually does no fighting. All right, that's a weird philosophical difference between picking a fight and starting a fight. Well, to me, uh, you're probably correct, but to me, picking a fight is like, you know, like you're picking to be in a fight, whereas he starts an encounter that he actually has no business in. <laughs> he just stands back and he's like, oh, this should be amusing. <laughs> Harvey Bullock, giant cop dick. Yeah, but, I mean, you see he's all bruised up and shit at the end, so he was flinging... Oh, that's probably just from him standing. <laughs> that is not a healthy man. <laughs> he's not that delicate either. I mean, shit... In the middle of all this, the long missing Montoya shows up, and for a couple of pages, they talk about the new bat. Fine, great, why not? Sure, I don't know why Montoya has anything to do with it. But uh, they fine. brought her back to be part of the task force. Yeah, but where she, she been? Uh, Bloodhaven, they say. Ugh, which is why you didn't know. She's been out fighting Nightwing or helping Nightwing or being the question. In Bloodhaven. I wonder if she's the question in this scenario now. No fucking interest in being. Well, I think she was in the initial outbreak of the New 52, right? Wasn't she? Um, Question? Yeah. Uh, I honestly don't know. The last, uh, you know, I read the Rucka one. That we got. We didn't even get the second one of that one because it was the damn question. Yeah. I don't care. But she basically, not quite blackmails, but bribes Bullock into joining the squad because <laughs> she'll get his girl, not girlfriend, but his girl, yeah. back on the force, who meanwhile is getting phone calls about killing people. <laughs> so, proving that... Harvey takes terrible uh, has terrible taste in everything <laughs> well he always has you know he's a cat guy now I mean there's so many weird Harvey things going on I don't know why they're trying to play him up so much you know but, yeah, but if you're going to remove Jim Gordon you have to the have suit, a cop to right. replace him like, particularly since it's Jim Gordon who's going to be on par or <laughs> working evenly with the police then you have to create a higher police presence so now you've got Commissioner Sawyer right Harvey Bullock Montoya right and then the the two they introduced in the other Batman the one that was designing his bat costume in the various colors Gutierrez Jesus H. Christ Gutierrez either way (laughs) yeah the uh, the whole color scheme thing is 
kind of amused and appalled me at the same time. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, just, just call it blue, dude. We'll, we'll call it even from there. It's, it'll be fine. What? No. <laughs> like, uh, we Here's an orange one. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> Carrot me, fighting Batman. Reminded me of the uh, fashion consultant in Tick. Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if you like to fight, clash. <laughs> I always thought of, uh, like... <laughs> old school action figures where you get you know here's Batman here's night vision Batman here's fights in snow Batman here's same figure dyed in red figure out why the fuck we did it and buy him (laughs) you gotta sell more characters man and they never do it's always like let's make eight Iron Man what about a villain Uh, Uh, nah they can fight themselves what the hell's going on in this flick That was weird. I, I don't care about this movie anymore. You did? Let's get the fuck out of here. What do you got? I got Astro City 24. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Now we're getting someplace. There's a monkey so. in the middle round two. <laughs> the guy is coin tossing bullets into his revolver. It is. Uh, <laughs> it looks horrible, but it's a cool concept at the same time. Sticks. The monkey, the gorilla gorilla we talked about last time, thinks back to his military days and an attack he participated in that kind of messed with his head a little bit. Um, At this point, he's joined Reflex 6, which is not a bad team name, I suppose. No, it could be worse. When you got things like Big Hero 6, I suppose Reflex 6 is not that far behind. Um... Fighting crime and alien speakeasies, which amused me terribly. Oh, no, it was awesome. <laughs> and then I love how he's like, this is just not me. Like, I am not this monkey. But see, that's the thing. He was still being a part of that team and then running around in a tuxedo and then being a part of another team. Which part of the first team was he having a philosophical problem with? All of it. Like, the problem he had wasn't the team. It was the fact that he didn't... He left Gorilla City... I'm sorry, I'm going to call it that. I have no, you know, fine by me. Gorilla Village, fine. Whatever. How crafty of you, Busiek. What? But then... It, uh, but he left Gorilla... Yeah. Um, Berg. <laughs> yeah. So that he could be a musician. Right. So every time he's a hero... And so they talk him to being a hero because he's like, look, I have this ability because he is a... Styx is a good person. Yeah. So he's like, I can help people. Maybe I should. And then he does that for a while, and it's rewarding. And at the same time, it's like, I'm still not being a musician. I'm not having the life that I came for. I'm still fighting, which is what I don't want to be doing. Yeah, he didn't, but they got very explicit when he put on that tuxedo. He suddenly became very happy to be a hero, and he joined another group. And it's very explicit about that. And there's no reason for it, given. No, the... I'll pull it back out again. uh, Please mean the comic. (laughs) I said again. Please mean the comic. I've never pulled it out on you. Thank you. Uh, Once again, we just break down to the childish. I can't keep doing this. He walks away. He sees some stuff. He talks to the band a little bit. He busks for a while. And then that's when the Samaritan comes up and gives him this little pep talk about only doing what makes him happy not specifically being a hero not specifically being a musician so he makes a phone call and he immediately jumps into the tuxedo and states right off I fucking enjoyed this right let me borrow this for a moment so what did this I read that Samaritan speech it didn't say go be a hero So how does Tuxedo it- Gorilla, good God. Because what he's done is he's presenting... Uh, basically, he tried to be a hero yeah, and not a musician. Yeah. And that didn't work. He tried to be a musician and not a hero, and that didn't work. Yeah. And he tried to be a hero who was a musician, and the heroics kept into it like it's hard to keep saying the same two words the heroics kept interfering with the music so what he does in the end as tuxedo gorilla 
it's not about the costume change, is he builds a team of musician heroes so that he can have both. Therein lies the difference. The new team aspect is about embracing both pieces equally. It's a cool thought process. And he had to work towards it, which is why music is amazing. But yeah, it's not about, it's not like, oh, well, I'm going to be, uh, the spandex didn't work for me because it, you know, bunched up my gorilla butt. But he didn't get the band together until after he was tuxedo. He, right. had two, he had two pages where he was very happy being tuxedo, and then he brings in the band. He's, well, very happy is an exaggeration. At the end, he says that was Tell your friends! Fun. Who says that when they're unhappy? I, fair enough, but the point being is he's presenting that out there so we can recruit the other heroes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you get right here. Ten um, seconds of dead air there. <laughs> I did need to make a splash because I've got an announcement. Uh, all right, I get it. <laughs> Hoist it on your own petard. Whatever. But Nobody no. knows what the fuck a petard is. No, it's Captain of Star Trek. No. <laughs> Once again, you show your ignorance of Roddenberry's vision. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to bed. Not with you. Thank you. For God's sake. You're, you're a little full of yourself, just assuming. I'm a pretty man. No, you ain't. Either. No, I am not. <laughs> Good night, kids. Bless you, fuckers. The Mean Geek is recorded live at the Reverend Mad Duck's apartment, whenever the hell we can get to it. Find us on Facebook, Stitcher, Twitter, under at the Meaner Geek. Subscribe to us through RSS. Or we can be located at our own site, www.themeangeek.com. And most importantly of all, you can find us as a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Email us directly at themeanergeek at gmail.com. Mind drink now? You may. <laughs>